So Rex, I, I read your book, your new book. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you're 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 unconvinced of my. I, I I'm, I'm skeptical of anything I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing I wanted to talk to you about today, the reason I brought you in, is not because I wanted to just rehash the whole book. Good. Um, <laughs> which I can sense the relief already. Um, but there's another topic that I've been wanting to do on this show forever now, and I realized as I was reading your book, it's hard for me to live with me a memoir. That you're also the perfect person to do that topic with, which has long fascinated me. Okay. And so this is a topic about a critically endangered species. Um, the World Wildlife Fund uh, calls it that, at least. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I'm looking at this list, right? There's the Sumatran orangutan. There's the black rhino. And right there is the white American NBA star. <laughs> Are you down well to help played. me? Well Are you played. down to help me? Yes. Are you down to help me help you? Yes. Yes, <laughs> I am. I'm dying to talk about this, actually. Okay, so what you should know about Rex Chapman is that he himself was a would-be savior in this way. He was a rare athletic specimen, a real great white hope at six foot four with a 40-inch vertical leap, who got drafted by the Charlotte Hornets out of the University of Kentucky at number eight overall. But the reason that Rex did not become the next white American NBA star is a deeply personal story. It's a story about not just expectations, but also addiction, crucially. And that part of his story is chronicled in his aforementioned new book, which you should absolutely go and check out. But our story here is about how once upon a time, a time even long before Rex, white America did not have to be this thirsty for basketball representation. In 1957, for instance, 93% of the NBA was white. 93%. But over time, of course, that percentage plummeted and plummeted all the way down to less than 18% last year. There is now no more comically obvious place where a white guy feels more like a minority than in the NBA. Because look, you're gonna watch March Madness this week and you're gonna see a whole bunch of white dudes playing basketball all month. And some of them are good, real good. But none of them are projected to be NBA stars. Not like Rex Chapman. In fact, it has been 10 years since a white American, Kevin Love, got named to an all NBA team, which designates him as one of the 15 best players in the sport. All of which actually makes me wonder who the best one even is right now. Do you have the uh, answer the, to that the question? The best white American NBA player? Yes. I, I thought I did the other day. Uh, um, I, two come right to mind, but I'm probably missing who the biggest one is. It's not an easy question. I go Austin Reeves and Tyler Hero, but who am I missing? So There's some... two good answers okay. on the list. Um, I think right now, Chet Holmgren. Chet Holmgren. Uh, probably up there, yeah, up yeah, there too. Yes. But, oh, definitely. But the point is, you got to think. Mm -hmm. And it's in fact like one of those things where you got to like, who else is out there? Well, this is the thing. We're going to Google right now, Rex Chapman. All right. White American NBA players. Who is best? This is a list from uh, Ranker.com, a deeply scientific website, of course, of that course. I've just found. Uh -huh. Updated quite recently. Yep. Here it is. Number one, Chet Holmgren. Yep. Number two, Tyler Hero, Miami Heat. Number three, Austin Reeves. Okay. I Lakers wasn't guard. far off. Just mentioned. Yeah. Number four, Alex Caruso. Uh, he's right up there, and I could I could have him love, at the top. Could love have him at the top. Alex Caruso. I, I love him. I'm in a fantasy football league with Alex Caruso. Uh, great guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alex Caruso, the thing you got to know about him is his fantasy football team has made more transactions than anyone else in the league because he, like he is on the court, is always grinding, always <laughs> trying as hard as humanly possible. Love Alex Caruso. Um, and then number five, I'm like, oh. I don't even know if this is gets into the complexity of race, I guess, of the concept. Jaime Hakez Jr., really? Yeah, right. no, That's yeah like, oh, okay. I guess we'll like, love him. yeah, let's do some colorism talk. Yeah, let's yeah, throw him yeah. in there, sure, I guess. <laughs> this is getting complicated. Um, but also illustrative of the difficulty. Um, number six, age 33 now, Gordon Hayward. Uh, yeah. Uh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hornets, uh, number seven, Max Struess. Max Struess is a nice player. 
Number eight, Walker Kessler. Yep. Of uh, Jazz. Okay. Now, what I want to point out, though, is that, okay, let's be real. This list, um, if you were to assemble this as a national team. Yeah. Oh, it gets beat. It doesn't get into the. Doesn't, yeah, doesn't, doesn't, make, doesn't, doesn't make the field. However, when you look at the actual all NBA roster right now, Rex, uh-huh. and you look around, it's not that there aren't white guys. They're just not American. Yeah, they're not American guys. Joker, uh, Luca, yeah. right on down the line. Dude, I mean... so, so before we get to theories as to why, <laughs> uh-huh. I do want to establish just the arc of history here okay. and how you fit into it for people who are just unfamiliar with, with how this cause right. um, came to be. <laughs> Back in the day, the idea of there's an NBA star and he's a white American guy right. was not terribly uncommon. Right. So in in the white American NBA star Hall of Fame, literally in the Hall of Fame, I suppose, too, who's up there that just comes to mind immediately in terms of the, the days of yore? Oh, Larry. Larry's right out there. Bill Walton. Brent Berry's dad. Rick Berry. Rick Berry, who played against my dad. My dad said held him to 38 one night. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pistol Pete. Jerry West. Bob Cousy. Oh, yeah, those guys. When you're growing up, did you idolize any of those no, those guys? I didn't. I I just didn't. In fact, I I disliked Larry. Larry Bird. Yeah, because he he didn't run and jump. I want to get to you as a kid growing up because the point at which it becomes obvious to you that you being a white kid who can do the things you can do on a basketball court, yeah. the point at which that became clearly an object of fascination was when. I was a, probably about 16, and a guy came up to me, and we were playing a road game, and I was coming out of the locker room. I was a sophomore, and he was a big, gruff-looking guy, and he kind of put his arm on my shoulder, and he looked over at me. And he said, he said, man, I love watching you play. You play just like a N-word, but you get to be white. And there was a bunch of adults standing around, and I was very uncomfortable. But then nobody mm. said anything to him. And then when I got on the bus, I thought, well, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Because in it, you're, he, he, he's praising me on, yes. on one hand. He's saying, this is oh, a fan oh of yours God, now. You know, you play just like one of them, but you get to be one of us. I think he thought I should be happy about that while he's demeaning every one of my f-ing friends who were black, all of the people that were dissuading me from, you know, hanging out with black people. Yeah, can you talk to uh, that, speak that, to that yeah, in that Kentucky? Was, I got a lot of N-word lover growing up. Uh, I'd go to away games. You know, I'd come out after games and people would say that to me. You guys are coming to the game where all my teammates are black. What are you talking about? Because I room with a black guy? Because the girl that I like to kiss is black? what is it? I don't understand other than you think you're better than they are. And so that has bothered me since I was a teenager. Well, you just described something fascinating, right? Which is a teenager, a kid even at this point is learning. Wow. The thing that makes me feel great playing basketball and being loved for it Mm -hmm. is now also being tainted by Mm -hmm. this notion that maybe my fans are are rooting for me for the wrong reason. The God, Rex Chapman, has all the abilities of any high school guard in the country. He comes from good bloodlines. His father is the coach of Kentucky Wesleyan. Rex being a... Apollo 6'5 guard Rex Chapman, the feature story on Al McGuire's preseason special. And that's the way it was for this 1985-86 Apollo basketball team. Having to deal with unbelievable hype, possibly the most publicized player in the history of Kentucky high school basketball, being counted upon to lead and be a key part... I want to get just to the idea, right, of you in a dunk contest. Yeah. Because when you talk about the way you played and how it was special and how it was that people were cheering you, not just because that guy is good, but that guy plays a way that we white people have felt like we did not have access to. Yeah, which is weird. They had had the access I did. Not the same (laughs) genes, but, you know. The dunk. The dunk. The dunk as this um, magical yeah, spe- superpower. I, my, my, I've told my mom about it before. I've said, nobody gives a shit, mom. The only reason they care is because I could dunk it. That's the only reason anybody gives a shit about any of this. It's because I could dunk it. 
the first connection you make with just casual fans who are showing up and realizing, holy shit, this kid can jump. That was fun, though. I was gonna, let's fun. talk about yeah, the It joy. feels like a superpower, kind of. Yeah. And I could, I could jump so high. Like, I could... Uh, I say that I could jump so high. <laughs> uh, no, but I it's could true. jump. It's like, objectively I, there I, were this times, tape of this Rex. <laughs> but there were times I would get a good jump. There's that, and, and would scare me. I got hurt all the time because, too, it's how I played, and I really felt obligated to put on a show. The only way that I could really play was to jump and run and expose myself athletically during every game, and there'd be those couple two or three times during a game you'd just bounce up and shoot one over an outstretched arm and the crowd goes crazy and you know I, so i knew i could do some things that you they don't didn't normally see but to me i was trying to keep up with all my peers and to a lot, to the fans i probably looked like i i couldn't see it at the time but i probably looked like a you know, a novelty well, kind of this thing. I went and watched the tape of you in the McDonald's All American oh, contest. God. Oh, okay. And one of the spectacular efforts turned in by Rex Chapman from Owensboro, Kentucky. Chapman, Look at that flip behind the back. Ten, ten, All tens. Listen to that Garfinkel, Bob Gibbons, and Sonny Hill. Perfect. But unfortunately, Dickie missed his first. Our Unbelievable. He flips it around his back. Man. A reverse Oliver. slam that's scintillating, sizzling, and they're going to love him in Kentucky. I tried to do some stupid dunk that, you know, I hadn't practiced or something like that. And, of course, you didn't even practice dunks at the time. You just Dunk contest was kind of new. But I missed a dunk, and a guy named Chris Brooks wanted – Howard Garfinkel, well, they wanted to give me the trophy so bad. They did. And I missed my first dunk, <laughs> so they couldn't – like, you had to make it. So anyway, right. The political system yeah, was, dying yeah, it was dying to make to, you to elect white me. kid yes, dunk contest they were champ. Dying to. But in the process, it was still impressive to go back and see, wow, Rex really did get up there. Yeah. No, I could, I could touch like 11 and a half feet up on the, crazy. Above the square. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> well, that, well, but, but to your point, there is a spotlight is. on that demographic of player yes. really f yeah, good at yeah, basketball yeah. and also clearly white clearly white and 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 then when i go back to all my college stuff in the college years i can say that all six schools were greatly considered up until yesterday when i made my decision however one school seemed to have everything i was looking for the whole package that's why i decided to further my academics and athletics at the university of kentucky all right. If you were a really good player in college, or maybe just good, and you go into college early and you you play and you do well, you can, you know, they kind of latch on. Like me, I I was on every cover of every you know thing yeah. as a so freshman and sophomore, and Danny Manning and David Robinson were easily the best players in the country at that time. They were juniors and seniors. I get it, but what are we talking about here? You know, I'm, I, I get it. I'm good, but I'm not them. I had older black teammates who I idolized. And at the time I was in Kentucky, I never thought I was our best player. Mm. I thought Ed Davender was our best player by a lot. I'm getting all of these accolades and my eruption at, you know, starting lineup. The Mine's louder than everyone else's. See Spencer. I'm watching another freshman, Chapman. Showtime. a future heavyweight and Rex Chapman, the greatest of all time. Chapman saying, I want to be in that same breath, huh? It made me feel very bad at times. I'm trying to be the best teammate I can be. The best part about all of it, my teammates, they, that might have been why we ended up losing because they really empathized with me somehow. They, uh, or sympathized, I should say, it's just, it's just weird. It's weird being like the best white player on a team. I think there is a weird loneliness to yeah. it. You got to really have the personality to be like, hey, fuck you, man. You know, I'm coming in here and I'm, gonna, uh, I'm taking, we're going to beat you guys and I'm taking all your girlfriends too. I, I don't tell this story often because it, but it, it leads me in. They knew what was going on. Twice when I was in college, 
uh, I don't know. I'm going to tell you something here that I don't know if you know. In the South, you know, we get black guys that come in to our campuses and they date white girls. <laughs> what? <laughs> So for those only listening, so, <laughs> I've just fallen upon a fainting couch. How dare and, you suggest the race is mixed? Here's the other thing. The coaches didn't care about that. And so to me that I felt very, uh, I, I didn't understand. I, however, those girls' parents felt very much like my coaches. Mm. So twice when I was in college, I went with two different teammates to the, to the girls' hometown with them for the weekend to pretend to be her boyfriend while we were in front of her parents. We might hold hands for a second, Man. walk in the room, and then at dinner, we'd sit beside one another. And it, it's so sad. It makes me want to cry every time because the girl just wants her parents to meet this good guy that she's met who plays, you know, basketball, who, who is in college doing great things. And Your friend. My friend. And we're having to do this. Now, did we have fun doing it? Was there something kind of exciting about it? Yeah. But we, we felt trapped. This is not an uncommon thing in the South. It may not be, it may be everywhere. I don't know, but I was raised there and that's how things were. And you, the it's younger wild, people, man. we just, it was something we couldn't talk about. I mean, this is the context for a topic that fundamentally is also to me, um, like funny and fun, right? So this yeah. is the trick of this topic, right? It's like, yeah. it's about trash talk. It's about um, a majority yeah. feeling like a minority. Yeah. Yes. And it's also about the context of America, which is deeply fucked up, as yeah. you just outlined. We could go into the political aspect of this, but I don't really want to. <laughs> I want to get to the, you know, to the comparisons when you're at Kentucky in terms of just like scouts. Mm hmm. Because it's one thing to be like, oh, wow, like high school prospect, super, super exciting. And then you're actually now among guys who are headed to the league. And what are scouts saying about you? So very interesting. I never thought about a, a scout watching me at Kentucky the entire time I was in school because I, I never thought about leaving. I, I, I just didn't. And, you know, again, there's seven, eight, nine McDonald's All-Americans on my team, and those guys are juniors and seniors. They're coming to scout them. I know that they're there. I never thought about them because I was not thinking about coming out of college. Uh, so that was something I never, you know, it was not a pressure I had because I, I just kind of left school and that was it. I felt like I was good enough to play after I'd been in college for two years and had played on the USA team with Danny Manning and David Robinson and Pooh Richardson and Ricky Berry, you know, guys that were going to be drafted in the first round this upcoming draft, I started on that team. And I could tell at the time there aren't 10 better players than I am in the country, even though I'm by far the youngest, because at the time you didn't come out of school unless you were Magic or or Michael. Yeah, the four-year player was the default. Yeah, and I didn't really want to leave. Um, you know, I thought about transferring to Louisville, which I thought, well, they'll kill me if I do that here. Man. And, and uh, but then I just left, yeah. Who were the comps you were getting? Well, it was always Jerry West and Pete. Um, but then I remember- <laughs> You're a 6'4", 185-pound-ish yeah, yeah. uh, guard who can jump, and yeah. you're getting guys they're, who don't. They asked me who- who I thought, and it was, I was, it was Gene Shu who asked me, and I was completely caught off guard by it. I had never heard, who's your comparison? What? What are you talking about? And uh, we're sitting in the meeting. They had like the third pick in the draft, and who's your comparison? And I, I said, oh, I, I don't know. And also, I didn't watch a lot of NBA because we didn't, it wasn't a, that big a thing. We'd get yeah, one yeah, game yeah. a week. League pass did I not I knew exist. a couple of teams. I said, Byron Scott? And he was like, okay. And I thought, Whew. and then I said, <laughs> I said, and you know, my idol's Daryl Griffith. Here we go. Here we go. Oh. 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 <laughs> he had his 
moment. Billy doesn't like that. <laughs> Daryl Griffith slams one in, and it's a 12-point lead for Louisville as Dr. Duncanstein performs. If you look at mine and Daryl's career stats, they're almost identical. So I really tried to play like Daryl. I, I tried to idolize his game. So Those are two black guys for the yeah, record Yeah, those here. are two black guys. So that that was um, – but that, that Gene Shue didn't poo-poo it. He was like, okay, I can see that. I thought, all right, well, if he can see that, that gives me confidence. Yeah. Because those guys are my heroes. Right. Okay. So, but your heroes are guys who don't look like you. Right. Well, I never, in I, terms never of I never saw anybody growing up that played like I did, I guess, um, that was living or, or active, still active. Um, I'm trying to think of the older D- Danny Ainge. Did he jump? Yes. Really? Yes. He didn't jump like I did, but he dunked. Danny was a great athlete. He's bigger than I am. A great athlete. Great athlete. Great basketball Undeniable. player. He wasn't as springy and bouncy wasn't as I was. Wasn't in contests the way that you No, were. no, no. But he could dunk. Brent Barry could dunk. Now, Brent's after me, but before... The, the point yeah, being, the point, though, I guess, is, that, is that I was kind of the, one of the first guys. Yeah, yeah like... Yeah. In Dan- the modern game. Yes. Yeah. Danny Ainge, um, you're grading on a hell of a curve to bring him into the, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, verticality conversation. There are guys... Uh, Todd Lichty, if you remember Todd Lichty, I you do wouldn't. Not. Yeah, it could bounce. Went to Stanford, played in Denver for a little while. Tom Gugliotta oh, later sure. on, Googs could bounce. Yep. I mean, co- goes up Bullets. and catches it. Yeah, let me think Washington. of older guys. Uh, older guys than me would be hard, uh, yeah. just because I just think this is the reality to, of yeah. Rex. Yeah, at some point we're talking about yes stereotype and convention but also a yeah. reality that you go through the list and it's like yeah not a lot of people who look like you can do what you do which is why your perspective when you get to the nba is so fascinating to me you know part of my plight personal plight is that i didn't want to be known as just the dunker and all of that and then when we we're talking about pistol pete and and uh jerry west i was nothing close to them I didn't come close to them. And that, that's right. to me, that's a failure. Like, it, to me, Steve Nash, my best friend, Jason Kidd, one of my best friends, none of them. The great Jason, point guards. Maybe, yeah, but none of them, Jason maybe, were as highly regarded as I was in as a freshman in college, sophomore. Jay, Jason was. Yeah, you were drafted eighth but, overall. But I'm just saying, as a, co- you know, McDonald's All-American, Parade All-American, those guys became Hall of Famers. They're my teammates. I, when we were playing, I didn't, like, Steve came off the bench behind me for two years. Like, that, that those guys, you know, there's part of my personal ego that, you know, I... I first round pick i should be i should be an all-star every year and if i'm not an all-star it's a failure and that's how i kind of i look back at my my all my stuff Mm -hmm. you know magic and isaiah and i'd see those guys and michael and all those guys they always gave me great love i think they felt like i was kind of this new little toy they had that was kind of what is this that we have here but i will say as a kid grew up in the 90s yeah i can verify objectively as a (laughs) non-white and non-black person the way you played was f-ing I just badass, played dude. like I played though. I didn't pl- I wasn't trying to be black. I was just playing. Muggsy Bogues has it in the attacking zone. Mug- Muggsy looking for somebody to give it to and he gives it to Chapman. Dribble drive. In deep. Nice little slam dunk. That's a great play. I didn't think that 6'4 guard could glide like that. Oh yeah, he's a very Dell and Muggsy and I are on the way to a game. Dell Curry, Muggsy Bogues and I are on our way to a game. Yeah, you're in the Hornets 1988. Now. We're on our way to the ball game, and we're listening to sports radio. Some caller calls in and says, Rex Chapman, I love him, jumps like a brother and shoots like your mother. And <laughs> we started, I was shooting like 18% for three or whatever it was. You know, well, okay. Well, listen, I think it's, it's understandable for you to be labeled as one thing, the white guy who dunks, and then you realize as a guy who's also like, a smart basketball player, you realize that's not going to get me yeah. into all-star games. Like, right. it get me to all-star weekend, right, right. but not to the all-star game right, necessarily. Right, 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 And so from the marketing perspective, right, as you're struggling with this label, I imagine the NBA. I didn't do it. I didn't do it the first year. So the dunk they, contest. Yeah. They asked me to do it every single year I was in the league except my last year. And I was not even a good athlete at that point. 
but they asked me every single year. They also asked me for the first five or six years to do the three point contest. I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't have a high enough percentage. They didn't do it on that back at the time. They just wanted me to do it. And I told them, absolutely not. I'm not going to the all-star game until I'm in the all-star game. And I wanted to go home for the weekend, uh, rookie year, uh, to Kentucky, to, you know, the bars where my teammate friends were and stuff. And uh, So you keep on saying no. I keep saying no to them. And then the second year, the the All-Star Game's in Miami, and the, the league made me do the dunk contest. Looks like he's going to try something similar. Yes, Rex Chapman is 39-inch vertical leap. He gets the bounce and the reverse two-handed jam. But so I did it. I had a good time. And then, all right, I thought that was done. And the next year, the game is in Charlotte. And I can't, I can't ba bail out. They make me do it again. Off the bounce, the reverse jam, Rex Chapman. Now there's timing. There's power. There's finesse. You've got all the creativity. So you've got all factors coming. Plus, you've got the hometown crowd. Now, you'll see when he makes the catch that he's way up over the top of the rim, and he puts it through very easily. Right there. I did it again. Uh, not my best dunks that year. Came in third. Um, and then after that, I was done. And they kept asking me, kept putting pressure on. And I, every year, I just said, no, I'm, not, I, I'm just not doing it. There's something um, hilarious and <laughs> fundamentally sad at the same time about the guy who's like ashamed in a dunk contest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the contest. Oh, that's of, kind of a bit, right? Well, it's just yeah. like the ultimate <laughs> showcase for ego and unapologetic athleticism. Yeah. Now, now, look, there's something in it. You know, uh, obviously, it's a stroke to my ego. To, Again, I said it earlier, it does, there is something that about it that feels like a superpower, you know, and, and also when that's gone, you feel like that's gone. And then for me, that was a big part of my identity. I, right. I have people every other day ask me, can you still dunk? No, I'm f***ing 56. If I, <laughs> I tried it at 50. I did it at 50 and I came down and I hurt my back and was fucked up for about six months and i said that's it yeah but i still have people to do that and then for my son who grew up playing basketball was a good player went to ball state and played everybody has asked him you jump like your dad he does not <laughs> he does not in this case he literally shoots maybe like his mother it, yeah right but no yeah <laughs> right exactly right <laughs> So I want to get to now just the arc of this, right? So as a marketing concern, the NBA wants you as many places it can yeah. get you. Uh -huh. As many dunk contests it can have Rex Chapman. It wants to inject Rex Chapman. Simultaneous to this, of course, is like the era of, I mean, it's Larry Bird being mm -hmm. in some of the most iconic yeah. commercials of all time. Yeah. Right? Against Michael and McDonald's yeah. commercial. What's in the bag? Good. Big Mac fries. Play you for it. You and me for my Big Mac? First one to miss watches the winner eat. No dunking. <laughs> one me. Which me? Get in there. Um, of course, him and Magic doing Converse stuff. I heard Converse made a pair of bird shoes for last year's MVP. Yep. Well, they made a pair of magic shoes for this year's MVP. Okay, Magic, show me what you got. The notion of marketing in the NBA. This must have felt obvious to you, why it is that they were trying to make you into a thing. I remember being, um, I'd just come out of school. I'd hired David Falk as my agent. This is Michael's agent, yeah, super Michael, agent. Yeah, yeah, Patrick's agent, yeah, a lot of people. So yeah, many yeah, stars. Super powerful in the NBA. Yeah. And we're talking one day, and I'm in an office. They got down to like a couple teams, and they were like, well, you know, oh, they'll take him here because, you know, and I was like, take him here because what? And they were like, well, you know, that you're white. 
you know, kind of, I was like, what are you f***ing talking about? And they're like, well, Rex, most of the season ticket holders are white and the sponsors are white and, you know, the fans are white. So, you know, people want to come see people play that are kind of look like them. And I was like, are you f***ing kidding me? But guess who took me? The Charlotte Hornets, brand new team right down there uh, in the Bible Belt. Yeah. And when I got to Charlotte, met the owner for the first time, and then uh, he took me in the basement to his house and poured me something to drink and said, hey, Rex, do you have a black girlfriend? And I was 19 or 20, and I was just t so tired of hearing right. this. And he immediately went, no, 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 I don't, I don't care. That's the, uh, I, you know, I don't care. It's just, and he said this, it's just, we live down here in the Bible Belt. Good God-fearing people don't like that. And you shouldn't do that out in public. What year was this? Would have been my rookie year, so 1988. So for the record, right? Stefan had just been born. I was he was, say. He, was a he was a baby. He was six months old. So that's Stefan, by the way, that Rex just mentioned, is Stefan Curry, as in his aforementioned friend and teammate Dell's son, Steph Curry, who was born, yes, in 1988. But I'm also jumping here to point out that in the year 2000, a dozen years after Rex's meeting with that Hornets owner, another white NBA player, a first rounder too, named Mark Madsen, who's out of Stanford, he was going through something similar to Rex during a pre-draft interview that he had, it turns out, which he later described to HBO's Real Sports. And Madsen's conversation was with an NBA general manager. Who said to me, Mark, you had a great workout. Another thing that's gonna help you in this league is that you're white. And he said, 20, 30 years ago, teams were mostly white and they were looking for good black players. And he said, now teams are mostly black. They're looking for good white players. When I heard that, it was a little upsetting. Number one, I believe in my own ability as a player. Number two, if an organization makes a decision based on skin color, that's a negative. Yeah, again, a real bizarro world for white dudes, the NBA is. But I also bring this up to point out that in the quarter century or so, since Mark Madsen said that on camera, the whiteness of the NBA hasn't simply decreased even further. It's also changed. It's globalized. Because as we mentioned before, and on the show just last week, actually, we talked to Hall of Famer Oscar Schmidt, the international player who inspired the international players who now rule the NBA. And lots of these international guys, I just want to make this very clear, are white as hell. What they are not, though, is American. I mean, here's a partial list, just a partial list of active white European players. There's Demontis Sabonis, Laurie Markkinen, Chris Porzingis, Nikola Vucevic. They're all all-stars, by the way, those guys at various points. And then there's the new wave. There's Alperin Shangun, Franz Wagner, those two future stars in my estimation, um, plus Mo Wagner and Jonas Valanciunas and Boyan Bogdanovic and Bogdan Bogdanovic and Yusuf Nurkic. And it, it goes on, right? It goes on and on and on. And I haven't even mentioned, arguably, the two best players in the entire league. Let's just talk about Nikola Jokic yeah. and Luka Doncic, right? Because Nikola Jokic, just for the record here, um, has about the same vertical leap as me. Mm -hmm. um, Luka is a different specimen in that regard, but he's also one of the most skilled players yeah. we've ever seen this young yeah. enter the NBA. And so these are two guys whose calling card is really, I mean, it's all around offensive skill, you yeah. would say. People used to say that Dirk, Dirk was like Larry. Yes. I think Luca is like Larry. Um, same just f you, just uh, likes when the opposing crowd taunts him. Um, and Joker is seven foot Steve Nash. Mm. It's just, he's a director out there playing at an advantage mentally every single night. Um, usually over his opponent. He out tricks everyone. He's big as shit. He can shoot it. He makes crazy runners and floaters. He's a great teammate. Um, I couldn't be a bigger fan. Luca's just young and still kind of wild, figuring it out, but he is 
I mean, he might be the best player on the planet. Right. Um, there are nights where it certainly yeah. feels like yeah, you can drop 50 yeah, as easily yeah. as anybody and his else. his passing. His oh, my both, God. Both of those both guys. Both of those guys. And Joker from playing water polo as a kid. These guys come from places other than America mm -hmm. and are killing also it. clearly white mm -hmm. and clearly killing it. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about why it is. I know why it is. Or I think I do. Why is it that America has an endangered species list when it comes to its white NBA stars and the rest of the world is flourishing? They're not dissuading their kids from playing basketball. They're not. We are. You know, we're, oh, I can't play that sport. It's not, doesn't suit your race. That's not how these guys are brought up. Right. Yeah. I mean, th th exactly. So we don't put Billy and Johnny in. But we put them in soccer and we put them in baseball and we put them in uh, lacrosse and tennis and everything else. Basketball, that's for them. It's not for our type. That's f***ed up. The other thing, they know time and score. They know the possession. They know everything because they've been coached extremely hard from a very young age. And if they talk back or if they gave any lip or if they this or that, no, f*** you sit down you're not going to play they don't coddle their overseas a aau aged kids in europe guys are not coddled guys are not coddled playing professional ball in europe so when european players come over here now especially when you can't hold and grab like you can they feel like it's easier to play in this league because more freedom of movement yes the athletes are better the coaching, though, they look at it as, you know, oh, we're not being coached up real hard around here. And it's kind of more like a vacation for them a little bit from sure. the coaches they played with growing up. We start coddling. Some of us do start coddling our, our kids. And if they they don't start on this AAU team, we take them to another AAU team. And pretty soon that you're making your kid a, a an excuse maker. And on this point, this point about nurture and not simply nature, I did want to bring in another source who is native to this entire world. Because Fran Frischella is an American who's been working as a college coach and an analyst and an international scout for decades now, including for Team USA. And what he's been doing is studying the systems of other countries for longer than anybody else that I know. And what Fran immediately pointed to was exactly that concept, actually. A system. Around the world, Latvia, Lithuania, the, you know, Croatia, Slovenia, it starts genetically and then it, then it becomes environmental, like how the game is actually taught. And over here in the States, we teach basketball a hundred different ways. Everybody's an expert. So we don't have a system like they do in some of the smaller countries around the world. Serbia, for instance, has fewer than 7 million people. America has 332 million people. And so what Fran had been especially curious about was Jokic in specific, his training in Serbia under the tutelage of the late Dejan Milojevic, the man who had coached Jokic as a pro in Serbia and then went on to be an NBA assistant with the Warriors before he died from a heart attack in January. I remember he, uh, he was a great player in Serbia, and then he uh, was Jokic's coach at 16, 17, 18. And I said, how did you develop him? And he showed me the drills. We were in a gym one day and he showed me the drills. And I said to myself, these are junior high school drills. These are basic fundamental drills. And and I'm always been a purist. But the, the point is, these guys who come over, come over here with an incredible um, fundamental base. They happen to be big and they happen to be better athletes than you think. And then there's one more thing, because on top of all of that, especially as the Balkans are concerned, this region ripped apart by war. There's also this deeper and, to some Americans at least, this almost familiar sort of motive. What do you have? You have a basketball court with a ball and you go out and play because it's cheap. Uh, the Jewish players of the 20s and 30s did that in New York and gravitated then to the African-Americans. And if you go around Europe, I'm telling you, it's a low income sport. And a kid from Belgrade or uh, Zagreb thinks that's their way out. Being great at anything takes a little bit of sacrificing of sanity in some regard, and they do it differently than we do. So what we're identifying here is culture. Okay, if you say so. <laughs> no, well, I mean, but culture, basketball yeah, yeah, culture, culture, right? Yeah, like yeah. as much as it is, I'm not saying that in Serbia, well, Serbian it, culture is naturally going to produce better NBA players, but the system of basketball seems to. Now all the all the kids in Europe who were little 
while those guys were playing, know that they too now, J- Joker, all Luca, they all can do this. And they're playing against adults in adults the Euro League. Adults in the Euro League. That most of them they're are going playing. pro sooner. Yeah, yeah. Then their their leagues are better. They're, yeah, they're well, just it's, are. it's just it's crazy just how 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 whiteness in this way has been transmogrified over yeah. to the <laughs> European continent. And it's like, wait a minute, this was what America's happened? game. Yeah, what happened? How can I help your people, Rex? Oh. <laughs> uh, the white American NBA star. I want to be. I want to be uh, solutions oriented here because it's 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 a desert out there, man. It's almost like you need to every every white kid needs to be assigned a black kid or black kid needs to be assigned a white kid at the beginning of school, and you guys grow up together and you do everything together, and then we got this stuff. <laughs> It's just exposure to each other and being able to right. integration. Integration, basically. <laughs> How dare yeah, you suggest forced this? Forced integration. <laughs> um, it's just you know, and starting starting so young, it, it's, to destroy the myths around what yes. I can't do and what they can't do. Right, right. It's just, uh, and we're at such a divide right now. It's it's hard to see through, but you know, I I honestly believe most people want to get along. Um, I just don't know if we know how. Right. I have another solution. Okay. Um, what if you donated your sperm to a Serbian woman? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you'd have to, we'd have to reverse a surgery. <laughs> <laughs> I thought if I got down on my luck too bad, I could just freeze some sperm and go and maybe sell it on the open market in, in Kentucky. Yes. How about that? I think what I found out today <laughs> is that's the solution to the endangered species that is the white American NBA star being saved is somehow making more Rex Chapmans. Uh, Rex Chapman, the author of It's Hard for Me to Live With Me, a memoir. Rex, this was a total joy. Thank you for doing it. Thanks, Pablo. Always. As I hover over my keyboard trying to articulate what it is that I found out today, I realize I'm in a bit of a pickle. Guys, I'm in a pickle because, once again, a serious investigation into a silly topic has brought me to a complicated realization about a far larger thing in American society. Because I should point out here, representation is not the solution to what ails us. Not the stuff that's really, really eating away at the soul of our country, the stuff that Rex Chapman was articulating, the injustice of how we treat each other. Representation, seeing a version of yourself in pop culture, in Hollywood, in comic books, on television, in NBA games, that stuff isn't going to fix that problem. But it does matter in a sincere way. And I should disclose that my favorite thing I ever experienced in sports is Linsanity. Because Jeremy Lin was a guy who looked like me, a person I'd never seen before in my lifetime on an NBA floor, doing stuff that I had never had the joy of witnessing. And I also now understand how it is that there's a zero-sum game around attention and marketing dollars. And so I also get the frustration of all of the black players who might have thought this novelty is taking stuff off of our table. It's a parallel, actually, to the way that Rex Chapman's career took off and his guilt about all of that. And of course, there are many, 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 many differences between the white American experience and the Asian American experience in the NBA and, of course, in this country in general. I hope that's needless to say. But there are also key differences between the white American experience and the white European experience when it comes to selling jerseys. When it comes to selling burgers and selling sneakers, it turns out that Americans are not exactly trampling over each other because Nikola Jokic and Luka Doncic are endorsing stuff, not the way they did with Larry Bird. Much of the chagrin of those corporations. And so, are they the next Larry Bird? Well, for that reason, they can never be. It's the difference between foreign and domestic. Which brings me all the way around to what it is that I found out today, which is that 
Yes, I am still very willing to urologically assist Rex Chapman in solving the endangered species issue. But I'm also kind of happy in a weird way that in my favorite sport, at least, the ultimate majority in America kind of has to feel as thirsty, as longing, as, as hungry to see themselves as the rest of us feel everywhere else. All right, I forgot to tell Rex that my dad is a urologist. I don't know if he'd come out of retirement to do this procedure, but he might consider it because he supports Pablo Torre, finds out, like our entire staff, who include Michael Antonucci, Ryan Cortez, Sam Daywig, Juan Galindo, Patrick Kim, Neely Lohman, Rachel Miller Howard, Ethan Schreier, Carl Scott, Matt Sullivan, Chris Tuminello, and Juliet Warren. Our studio engineering by RG Systems, our post production by NDW Post, our theme song, as always, by John Bravo. You are very welcome from all of us, white America. We'll talk to you next week.